right, put your hands together, lift your voice and glorify the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Come on, you can do better. Lift his name. He's worthy of our praise and of all glory. Lord, we lift you in this house. We thank you because you're good and because your mercies, they endure forever. Your word assures us that everywhere Jesus went, he did good. And this place is no exception. You're already healing the sick. You're making all things right. You're turning things around. You're making our lives better. You're doing a precious, precious thing in our lives. And we are glad that we are here to receive it. Receive praise and receive glory. We thank you for gathering us. We are assured that you never gather your people for nothing. You're not about to start now. You have a word for us. You have instruction for us. You have correction for us. You have reproof, dear God, for us. We thank you because you have encouragement for us today. We thank you because you're here to lift us up. Thank you because our wayward sons and daughters are being called back home by the power of your Holy Spirit right now. We thank you because our marriages are being put back together in the name of Jesus. We thank you because you're doing a thing in this place that no man can afford, that only the hand of God can deliver. Because you're great and mighty, we understand that no small thing can fall from so great a hand as the hand of God. And the hand of God is moving to and fro in this place. You're doing a new thing. We receive it with thanksgiving. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. To just let the master know you love him for just one minute in this place. In this atmosphere of faith, just let him know, Jesus, I love you and I am here for you. Do absolutely what you have desired to do in this space and right here, right now. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? You're matchless in all your ways and all your works are pure in you. There is no darkness, no disappointment. You are great in you. There is no confusion. You are not perplexed. You are seated, shiftless on your throne. You have a good plan, a plan for good and not for evil to give us a future. And I hope our end is determined inside of your hand. And we rest assured knowing that you see our hearts you can handle everything that comes our way. Hallelujah. As we stand in this place, there is some of us that are expecting healing from God, physical healing in our bodies. Won't you just reach out for it in Jesus' name? Right now in this service, someone is, has this pain on your left side of the body in the lower back from the waist going down. If that is you, a sharp pain in the left side of your body on your lower back going down, receive your healing right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, because you came that we may be free and free indeed, that we may have life and have it in abundance. We receive your rule and we receive your reign. Holy Spirit, this is your space. If you've desired to do a thing with this meeting since the beginning of time, we ask that you do it and inhibit it. Let nothing, let no one stand in your way. Hallelujah. We bless your name and we honor you much this king. Speak to us, our hearts are open. Our hearts are open. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Come on, Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Are you glad you're in the house of God tonight? Today, this morning, are you excited you're here? Are you excited you're here? Amen, amen. We're here because God looked around and of all the people of the earth, God decided that you would be seated right here, right now. And God is intentional. You remember during the ICC, Dr. Ron taught us that God is methodical and he is strategic and he is intentional. So God allowed you to be here on purpose. Amen? And everyone that is here is here because they need a savior. Amen? I want you to take a good look at your neighbor on the left and on the right. Just look at them. It doesn't matter how good or how made up they look this morning. They need a savior. All right? So I, I, I don't want you to feel like you're in the wrong place. You're in the right place. You're here because God has determined that you should be here. They need a savior. They are going through some of the same things that you're going through. 
even if they're looking prim and proper, look at them, look at them. I want you to be free. The Bible says where the spirit of God is, there is liberty, there is freedom. I want you to be free. So familiarize yourself. Some of you have looked straight since you entered this place. You haven't looked at your neighbor. Look at them and realize they're going through the same problems. I know they are looking smart and wonderful, <laughs> but even they have been struggling to dry their clothes in this weather. They have been struggling. Don't, don't let the way they are looking today fool you. They've been struggling. But God is good. And that's why we are here today. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. We are reading it in the New King James. We'll start from verse 14, go all the way to verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2 from verse 19. It says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. 15, be diligent to pre present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 16, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. 17, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, and it has this seal. The Lord knows those that are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, this is actually the last letter that Paul is writing, just before he dies. Actually, it is said that this, he, he, might not, he, he really did not last for very long after writing this letter to Timothy. So, it's among the last of his letters. So Paul is writing this, and it is like the summary of everything that he knows about life and ministry, about everything that he knows maybe about God. You could put it that way. So it's among his last letter. It's actually his last letter just before he dies. So when Paul is writing this, he's writing it with a different kind of heart. If you read other letters of Paul, you can tell there is a difference between the mood in this letter than in others. Yet there is victory. Paul is in chains by this time. He is a prisoner. But there is victory that is roaring through Second Timothy. Hallelujah. And we're going to see that in just a bit. So Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a son of his in faith. And Timothy is in the church at Ephesus doing the good work of God. And he's saying to him many things. He's reminding him, Timothy, do not forget, do not forsake the gift of God that was put inside of you through the laying on of hands. He's reminding Timothy, something happened to you. I want you to remember that things are not just the same anymore. You are different, called out by God. He's telling him, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Even me, I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to handle that which I have entrusted to him until the day of the coming of our Lord and Savior. He's telling him, Timothy, be loyal to the faith. Then he's telling him, listen up. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know things could get difficult, but I want you to be strong. I want you to do a couple of things, he's telling Timothy. I want you to consider that you are a soldier. And a soldier does not entangle himself in the affairs of the marketplace. All right? Then he tells you, I want you to realize the discipline that an athlete has. Because no athlete wins the prize unless he runs according to the rules. All right? So it will be like him saying, if Kipchoge were to run today, and he decided I must finish the race in under two hours, and then going round that track, Kipchoge decided there is no way I will make it in under two hours. So what I will do is that where I am, the finish line is just across. Instead of going round, I will cut across this way. He will get to the finish line. Will he get the reward? Absolutely not, because the person that runs the race and gets awarded is the one that runs according to the rules. He's telling him there are rules that have been set for conduct in the house of God, for conduct as a believer. There are rules, and the one that makes these rules is God, the one that we love and serve. So he's telling him, be as an athlete as well. And then it says, be like a hardworking farmer. Because a farmer is a hardworking person. They get up early in the morning. They do not even know whether that seed is going to sprout, but they have to put in the discipline. So he's telling him, remember to be as such as well. He tells him, listen up, Timothy. Consider these things that I have said to you. God will make it plain and clear to you. Now that gives us the place of reading the word and meditation. If you are here on Wednesday, or if you look at your bulletin, you're going to find that discussion about serving in humility or service in humility. Pastor Francis taught us about it on Wednesday. Now, in the last of those H's that are there, it is the word habit. And you must, as a servant, as a believer, you must have the habit of solitude, which means you take time still away with Jesus. 
go and just be with him. Just sitting with Jesus for instruction. And then number two is searching the word. You must have the habit of searching the scriptures. Searching the scriptures is not just complete if you sit down and read the Bible. It is not just complete if that is all you do. Together with reading the Bible, you must create time to meditate on God's word. Remember the instruction that is given. It says, do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate upon it day and night. He says, then you shall make your way prosperous. It comes by meditating. Paul tells Timothy, listen to these things I'm telling you. Do not just let go of them. Think about them. The Holy Spirit will make it plain to you. If you're reading the Bible, you're doing great. But if you're reading it without meditating, without taking some time to let that word seep into your spirit, you're, you're missing out. All right? So your morning devotion must be different. Every time you're reading scripture must be different. If you're not taking some extra time to think, because it is in meditation that you allow the word to come in. You allow the word to soak. You sort of marinate in the word, for those people who like to cook. You're marinating in the word. You're letting the word get in. You see, as the word comes in, the Bible says, the entrance of your word brings light. It makes even the simple wise. As you meditate, the word is coming into your soul. And this is what the word is going to do because the Bible says your word is a lamp to my feet and light to my path. The word is light. As it comes into you, it starts to shine light into some dark corners of your life. It starts to reveal to you some of the things about yourself that you didn't even know. It starts to show you that you are a terrible, wicked person and you need a savior. Now, it must stop at you need a savior, all right? Because there is hope for you and the savior is available. Because if it just tells you that you are a terrible person and stops there, that is condemnation and that is the devil. The devil condemns. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. So each time you listen to a message or you read the word and the word is making you feel condemned, like there is no hope for you, you are dead, you are doomed to destruction, there is nothing that can be done to your situation, that is the devil, that is condemnation. Because God will tell you, conviction tells you, this is a terrible thing you have done. How can you do such a terrible thing? But there is hope. If you turn around, there is hope for you. Bonas if you such that we are not lost in this place for, oh, I am a terrible person. There is no hope for me. Let me continue to live my life in sin. No. That is condemnation. And that's where the devil would like to find excitement in. Somebody told us misery loves company. The devil is miserable. And he's going to be miserable forever, for all eternity. And so he's looking for company. He'd like that hell will be filled with people. Again, somebody else told us that a lot of the heat in hell will be generated also from the multitudes that the devil has pulled to himself. Refuse to be firewood in hell. <laughs> so take time to, to meditate, to think upon these things. Now, Paul, having said these things to his son Timothy, con continues to encourage him and tells him this is a faithful saying. They have said it is actually a song that they used to sing in the early church, those days of Akina Paul. He says to him from verse 11, if we died with him, we shall live with him. This is hope. He's telling him there is hope. If we died with Jesus, we shall live with Jesus. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure the sufferings of this day and age, we shall reign with Jesus. And then he says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. Remember the example that is given. If you deny him in front of men, he will deny you in front of his father in heaven. But here is something that warms my heart up. It says, but if we are faithless, he remains faithful because God cannot deny himself. That regardless of where it is that we are going, regardless of what it is that we do, he is solid and standing. We can lock our focus onto Jesus. Hallelujah. Bishop JB said here on, the, on, on Saturday while we were closing the conference, he said Jesus is our captain and he is a faithful, trustworthy captain. We can be sure we will get to the end. Yesterday when the cell leaders were here, Pastor Alice mentioned and said that there is no way you can lose in the team that Jesus is the captain. And that is the beauty of us being believers. Jesus is our captain. That should fill your heart with excitement. That your captain is not just any other ordinary person that is flawed. I mean, if you're looking at the pastor, the pastor is a great person, but remember we were told here in the ICC that the pastor is just the MC. You are the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. So you cannot look at the MC 
He's not the object of your desire. The object of your desire is Jesus, the bridegroom. Hallelujah. Come on, bona sefiwe. So he tells, this, he tells this son of his, listen, this is a trustworthy saying. You can trust him. Then he starts to give him instruction. Says, remind these people that you're working with that they should not give themselves to conversations and strife that don't bring about any help. He talks about it. He calls it, in the message, he calls it um, high-sounding nonsense. Have you ever been in a conversation where you're talking with somebody and they look like they're saying a lot of good things, but it is nonsense if you start to look at it. It sounds like great advice, but then you go back to scripture and you realize that is absolutely nonsense. I cannot help myself. That's why I need help. Jesus, Psalm 46 talks about him in verse 1, about him being an ever-present help in times of need. So he tells the people, do not engage yourself in this high-sounding nonsense. He calls it old wives' tales. I don't know what that would mean. But masturi za wale watu wanauka waze wa mas. At the end of Mali. Mwai pata story, aujui kama inakuja, ama inaenda. Ni story tu ikotua hapo, lakini inajaza time yenyu. It is just wasting. Hey, your time imeisha, you know? He tells him, keep away from those things. Then he gives us an example of these two people called Hymenius and, um, is it Philetus? He gives this story of these two people right there. And he says, their story has spread like a cancer. They are lying to people, telling them there is no more resurrection. And when I read that, I think that time is just the same as this time. Because right now in our offices, aren't they filled with people who don't believe that Jesus is alive? People who don't believe that Jesus is king? People who believe that there are many ways to heaven? Apart from Jesus, when Jesus explicitly said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one, absolutely no one can come to the Father but by me. In your, in your schools, for those that are in school, we have many young people who are trying to steal each other away, trying to tell you, and you start to think, I, by the way, am I am the one that has it wrong. It was the same in that time. It was spreading. They used that terminology. It spread like a cancer. It was going into random parts, almost everywhere, affecting almost every part of the body of Jesus Christ. And that is happening in our day and age. You stay in your family gatherings and you're the one that is a believer. We're going into the festivities right now. You sit in that family gathering and everybody is looking at you like you have lost your mind just because you're not participating in some of the rituals that they want to do. And if you pay attention, it will be very, very, very appealing. You will start to think... It is possible for you to think that. But I want to remind you that if it was true back then, it is true today. Hallelujah. He says to them, it will spread like a cancer. And it may look like the church is under attack. It may look, it might be, but it may, I want to tell you, remind you of the words of Jesus. He says that on this rock I shall build my, my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. This project, you and me, are a project, the work of the hands of God himself. He does not say, I shall send a man to build the church. He says, I myself shall build the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. In other words, even if the gates of hell should come, they shall not prevail. When you're going to your family gatherings, when you're sitting in the office, when you're talking with friends and people here and there, it is important for you to remember, it doesn't matter whether you're the only one that is standing alone. You must remember this thing that he now reminds him. I think in verse 19, says to him, listen up. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God still stands. It doesn't matter that everyone should fall away by the wayside. The solid foundation of God still stands. The foundation of God still stands and it is solid. I don't know whether you've been to a place where they have this thing called quicksand it, where, or sinking sand. You think something is solid and then you go and walk on it and you're going sinking faster than you ever thought. That is not about, that is not God. God is not like that. He's solid. His foundation is solid and it stands for real. That is one truth you can take to the bank. You see, it's difficult for you to focus on something that is shifting. It is difficult for you to focus on something that goes this way and goes this way and goes, something that is oscillating. It is very difficult. That's why scripture reminds us up here, he said that if we are faithless in, in verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. 
we can trust God. I think that's my most favorite thing about God. The fact that he's dependable, he's faithful. At any time, somebody said to us that every time you find that you are far away from God, guess who moved? It is not God. So I can always run back. Have you ever been in a place where you've gone with many people and then you got lost? Maybe in the Nairobi show or some other chaotic thing. I remember many years ago when I was a kid here, we went to a Sunday school thing. And I think the Sunday school superintendent at that time was, uh, I think, Dr. Mary Kamina. And we went to the, I don't even remember where it was, but I got lost. In that confusion, I got so lost. And I was just a young child, so there were no phones back in the day. <laughs> I lived in days where there were no phones. Uh, <laughs> so there were no phones, and I couldn't call anyone. So I was just lost. But while I was standing there, I, I don't even know how. Anyway, somehow somebody came and found me and realized that I was from DCK and came and brought me to the team. But I remember the teacher saying to us that you guys must remember, I told you that ukienda, uwono umepotea, kumbuka tulikuwa tunapatana hapa malikuna ikitu. There was a tall thing structure. That it doesn't matter how lost you are, if you can find your way back to that thing, you have found your way back home. And that is what Jesus is to us. He is a solid foundation that stands sure. It doesn't matter how far off you have wandered from the cross. If you can find your way back to what Jesus did more than 2,000 years ago, you have found home. Bonasifiwe. The solid foundation of God still stands. But then he continues to say that foundation, it stands and it has these two inscriptions on it. Number one, the Lord knows those that belong to him. And number two, he says, let everyone that calls on my name depart from iniquity. He says, I know those that belong to me. And when I read that, I felt something inside of me shift. Because it is one thing for somebody to say, for God himself to say, I know those that belong to me. It's like, that's my thing. I know it. And that gave me a lot of comfort and encouragement. Because I thought to myself, God is not seated in heaven confused. God is not perplexed, wondering, Siku inaenda kufika. Sasa ni nani wangu? Do you, do you guys remember? Ni nani wangu? Ni nani yamekuwa kifanya? No, God is not like that. God is seated in heaven and he knows those that belong to him. Since the days of the early prophets, God knows those that belong to him. You see, in the eyes of Elijah, he used to think he was the only prophet who had not defiled himself. He used to think he was the only one. But that was because Elijah was a man. He was looking at the eyes, in, through the eyes, just like a man. But God was seated in heaven saying, I know those that belong to me even those many years ago. He said, I still have many hundreds of them that have not defiled themselves. I know those that belong to me. God is saying that even today. I gave the example in the first service about um, evangelist Reinhard Bonke who went to be the Lord last, last, yesterday. And I thought I was reading his story last night and it was intriguing that there is about 75 million recorded conversions in his meetings. People who have said, yes, I accept you as Lord and Savior. 75 millions. And I thought, wow. And I have watched some of those crusades. Bonke has been in Kenya a couple of times. Watched those things. Seen him do all these things. I've read the book um, Evangelism by Fire. And another small tag that was given is written about fire people, like people that are on fire about evangelism. But imagine thinking about those kinds of people. We get to stand in line together with people like that, faithful people. You get that opportunity. You get to stand in line. Because when Paul is writing to Timothy, he's saying to him, I want you to, what you have received from me in the presence of many witnesses, hand it over to other people, faithful men. Who are the faithful men in this church? You and me. Do not think that he's talking about faithful men that are the pastors or the G12. He's not talking about the ministry team. He's talking about you and me. Because every time, every Sunday, bishop stands on this altar or any preacher stands on this altar, what they're doing is what they have received in the presence of many witnesses, they are giving it to you. What do you do is that you leave this place and go and share it with other people in your office, in your classroom. That is your responsibility as a believer. You do not say, your cousin, I'm a pastor. You are the pastor. If you've gone through the Father's vision, you know about Pastor of One, yeah? You do the work. So he's saying, listen up. We get to stand in line. Together with all those generals of old, we get to stand in line. We get to actually be counted and say, Lord, I did not drop the baton. When somebody dropped, 
put it in my hand. I received it and I ran my race. That is what Paul is saying towards the end when he's getting to the final, um, to his valedictorian speech. He says, I have run the race. In 4 verse 6, I have run the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, and not just to me, to everyone else who has kept the faith like me. That ought to be you and me, beloved. Hallelujah. Now, listen. Knowing that we get to stand in line with such people. Hebrews chapter, two, chapter 12 sorry, refers to these people as owing to the fact that we have a large cloud of witnesses. Those people that have gone ahead of us. Those people that were serious about it. In the Harvest Conference this year, our theme was Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 in the message. It says, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection in life in Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Or in different versions, it says, set your mind on things above. Hallelujah. So there were men right from the beginning in God's redemption plan. There were men that set their eyes on things above. With men as early back as Enoch, who walked with God until he was no more. Setting your eyes on things above. I know we go through challenges. I know even this year, there are some people that, have been, uh, that, that, that I talk to and I know they are done with 2019. Maybe in this service and you're done. You're just done with 2019. You can't wait for 2020 to start. So that you start afresh. But you see, allow me to challenge your thinking for just a bit. That, could that be because your comfort is in the calendar that is made by men? Because you feel like something will shift when you get into the first of January in 2020? Because I'll tell you the truth. Anything that brings a fresh start that is not Jesus is temporal at best. First of January will come 2020 and it will be all good. It will be a clean, fresh slate. And then July, the first of 2020, and you will be done with 2020. I can't wait for 2021. And you will be stuck in that cycle all your days. But Jesus is saying to you right now, listen up, child. I am here for you. I make all things new. If only you trust me. If you came for the ICC, this message must have gotten into your mind. Only believe all things are possible. Only believe. Jesus says to the family in Mark chapter 9 verse 23, all things are possible to the person that has faith. All things, all you need to do is to believe. Some of us have been praying for things for far too long. You've been praying for your children. Some of us are sons and daughters in our families and things are not going right for you. You have just been trying to graduate but the devil just doesn't want you to graduate. He's just not letting go of your hand. Just, and so your mother is on top of you. She's in your ears telling you you are such a waste of my school fees. You are such a waste of my money. Where when you plot, where when you nyumba, where when you gari, ningekuwa nimefanya hizo zote lakini wewe unani. And you're like, I can't, I'm done with 2019. I can't wait for 2020. 2020 is my year of graduation. And that's fine, beloved. But if you're not going to bring Jesus in it and to allow him to teach you how to go through it, whew, I have some news for you. It's not good news. 2020 is going to be a repeat of 2019. It shall be 2019 pro. Because Jesus, Beloved, Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution, man. Only Jesus. Not Jesus and things. Not Jesus and reading some good books. Not Jesus and empowering yourself. No, 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 no. Jesus is the answer. Because to say Jesus and is to put Jesus on crutches. He cannot stand by himself. Jesus end some great conversation. Jesus end a good apology. Jesus end, no, Jesus is the solution. Jesus teaches you to do those other things. So that Jesus is not a means to an end. That when we get, Jesus is bringing our miracle. Then when we receive our miracle, what do we do? Walk away from Jesus until we need another miracle? Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is the means and the end. Whew, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So he's saying the solid foundation of Jesus stands. He, it has these two inscriptions that God knows those that belong to him. And number two, he says, let all who call on me depart from iniquity. When I read that, it brought something else. Why would God say, I know those that belong to me? 
And here's a why that I think. It is possible for everyone to know you as God's property, but God himself. Did you know that? It is possible that everyone knows you belong to God. Everyone thinks you belong to God, but God doesn't. He doesn't even know you. If you read the Bible in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 22, it says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we healed the sick in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did great and mighty wonders in your name. But then he will say to them, verse 23, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. These are men and women who are taken by the gospel. They were healing the sick and they were preaching the good news and they were doing all these things. And these things were working for other people, but for them they were not. And so the Lord says to them, depart from me. Now, it, it, it confuses my mind every time to think, what if that is what God will say about me? Imagine, I will go and present myself at the pearly gates of heaven on the day that I have finally been called home. And I go home and I am not afraid of death because I know I am going to spend eternity with Jesus. And I arrive at the gates of heaven. I say, Lord, you see this multitude of believers? By your grace, I have brought them into the saving knowledge of Jesus. So show me to my mansion and I'm ready. Nimefanya kazi duniani? Niko tayari kwa mapumziko kwa kweli. When we went to Mauritius with Pastor Beatrice, one of the ladies there was saying, kept saying to us, if you get to heaven and find a bed, that bed is mine. Because I have worked for God. She's 73, is it 73? 75 years old. And she does not stop. She's always running that old grandma. Loves Jesus. Serves the Lord passionately. She said, if you get to heaven and find a bed, don't you dare look at it twice. It belongs to me. That's why I'm serving the Lord with all my gladness. So some of us will get to heaven and you're ready for your house. Because you're like, God, I have, haven't I worked for you? Kazi tumechapa. And I know some of you are like that here. Kazi tumechapia bwana uku. Nikiwa youth. Kwanza those of you that are no longer youth. Allow me to come for you. I'm coming for all your edges. Those of you that are not youth, you're like, hmm. Tukiwa vijala missions tumeenda. Tumeingia, tumeubiri, tumetuanga injili kule. Tumeenda lokichogi na kina pastor Zachary. Tumeenda, ah, what are you saying? To me, mashule, my campus. What are you saying? Nini vijana mnacheza sikuizi? Ah, sawa. But imagine after having done all those things, and then you show up at heaven's gates and you say, Lord, we heal the sick in your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. We cast out demons in your, whoo, in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. We did mighty one. Oh, Lord, thank you for your name. We did mighty wonders in your name. And then the Lord looks you smack in the face and says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Where do you go when God himself tells you, depart from me? Because what do you do when your boss tells you you're fired? You run to God, right? What do you do when your husband kicks you out? You run to God. Okay, let's be fair. What do you do when your wife kicks you out? You run to God, yeah? What do you do when your parents tell you, get out of this house? You run to God, yeah? What do you do if you, for instance, are excommunicated from church and told, go away, we hand you over to Satan? <laughs> you run to God, True. But what do you do when God himself is telling you, get out, depart from me, you worker of iniquity? Where do you go? You are lost and confused. I think that is hell. That is what hell means. To go in a place where God's presence is not. Because God's presence is what heaven is. Where God is, there I am. That is heaven. I want to bring this contrast in the book of, jo of Luke chapter 4. The Bible says, and Jesus, when he was being, after being baptized, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Imagine that is Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. It continues to talk, to give the account, the detailed account of how the devil came to tempt Jesus and tempted him and tried him this way and that way and pulled him up and down and apart. And Jesus kept replying to him with scripture, using scripture saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And then when the devil left him, the Bible says, and the angels came and ministered to him. Jesus was in the wilderness, led there by the Holy Spirit, and angels were attending to him because he was in a place where God was. If you look at the Bible in the book of Luke chapter 8, just a few chapters after that, there's a story about the guy called the Gerasene demoniac. You remember that guy who, has a legion, who had a legion of demons, and they were cast out of him and thrown into the pigs? Do you remember that story? The Bible says this man was led into the wilderness by the devil, by the demons. They tormented him and led him into the wilderness. 
There is a contrast between those two people. Both of them were in the wilderness, true, but one was tormented and another one was being ministered to by angels. He was being re-energized because after that, Jesus went and launched out into ministry and he did a great job for about three years and that's why we get to stand where we stand today. It started in the wilderness, but he was led there by Jesus. If you find yourself in difficulties, beloved, you need to ask yourself, How, am I here because I have been led here by, by demons? Is it my own act? Or is it God? Because the truth is, sometimes we go through difficulties because the Lord would allow that we would learn something. I'm not saying that you've been called for difficulties. No, that's not what we're saying, not at all. But there are some situations that would come that you would need you would need to learn something from out of there. Paul encourages the church, the early church, several times and tells them, listen up, guys, I know you guys are worried, but I want to assure you that the challenges you're going through are not unique to you. Other believers, other brethren in other churches are going through the same thing all the way across the world. So you're not alone. See, we started by me telling you that even your neighbor is struggling at a season. The challenges you're facing, even them, they're going through. Everyone here has had a challenge of finances at one point. It doesn't matter what car you look, it looks like they are driving right now. Everyone has some challenges of finances. But everyone is going through challenges of one sort or the other. Are we together? So the challenges are not a thing. He says the Lord knows that are those that are his. It is possible for you to be known as belonging to God by everyone but God himself. And that is the tragedy of all life. Look, uh, not look, Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 from verse 1. God is writing the letters um, to the churches, the seven letters to the churches, and he writes this to the church inside. It's Revelation chapter 3 from verse 1 to 2. One and two. He says, and to this write to the angel of the church in Sardis and say to him, I know your works. Revelation 2, verse 1. Aha. Uh -huh. well, Revelation 3, sorry, from verse 1. He says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It is possible for everyone to know you as being alive. You have a reputation of being alive. At your office, you're the person that even started the Bible fellowship, the staff fellowship. In school, you're the kind of person that, you know, you're always a man of peace. Everybody knows you as a person that, you know, loves God. In your family, they know undu ali okokaka na ikashika. You have a reputation of being alive. But like the church in Sardis, imagine if God is looking at you and says, I know you have a reputation of being alive, but I know you are dead. That is a sad thing. And you see, it is even amplified because sometimes we don't even know how the extent of our wickedness. Have you ever done something and you thought to yourself, I uyoni mimi, ninaweza nikafanya kitu hiyo. Ama unarusha mtu kijina unajiambia, wow. See, how joy kwa nini? Wonderful people. If you're here and you you drive on a regular basis, you might understand this example. If you're driving on the road and somebody cuts you off in a bad way in traffic. And now you feel like you're at home. You don't even say a word. But that only reveals this competitive, wicked nature inside of you. You didn't even know it was there. Ukienda uko mbele ndi unajuliza, shidangu ina kuanga gani? Kwa sababu watu umekanyaga mafuta na vinyi economy imearibika, mafuta iko benyingi, umemaliza mafuta kwa gari yako. Unakimza na mtu na labda alikuwa napeleka mtoto wake hospitali. Saya anakimbia, wewe hakuna malinenda hivi. But these things happen, they reveal the dark nature of your heart. Imagine those things that you don't even know about yourself. God knows about you. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the designer of the thoughts and the intentions of man. So God sees those things. That's how he knows those that are his. 
and it will be terrible, I will say it again. It will be terrible for you to be known as belonging to God by everyone but God himself. For you to be doing works, works in this place, works, but God himself is looking at you and saying, I don't know you. The end of the good book in the Bible, um, Revelation chapter 22, says this, verse 11, let the one who is sinning, let him continue to sin. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. It says, let the one who is righteous continue to be righteous. And let the one who is holy continue to be holy. It is as if God is saying, I have said everything now. If you are sinful, continue to live in your sin. If you are vile, continue to live in your vile. If you are a thief, continue to thief. If you are doing bad things, continue to do them. If you're a good person, continue to do those good things. If you're righteous, continue to be righteous. If you're depending on me, continue to depend on the Holy Spirit. Continue to do those things. And then verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming soon and I have my reward at hand. Why? Because I know those that are mine. I know those that are mine. So it will be a terrible thing for you to be known as gods by everyone else but God himself. Because when he's bringing his reward, then as you're lining up, he will be giving a reward to him and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Well done, good and faithful servant. As you're standing in line, you see, Moshigadi, ameambiwa, well done. Unasema, hata mimi ni taingia. Hata mimi. Kama huyo amepata, nandi wanakuwa na mambo. Unakutu unaingia. Alafu, anasema, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You're wondering, ay. But you see, the problem is that we are looking at people using the eyes of man. God speaks to Samuel and says, listen up, man. You are looking like man, and man looks at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. The zana of the thoughts and the intentions of men. Who knows you? Because to be known by people is a good thing. But to be known by God is a beautiful thing. To be known right is to be known by God as he is. Because there are things that we do in secret that nobody ever, ever will find out. By then, nobody will ever find out about them. Because, I mean, I would decide to scare you and tell you, one day it shall all be brought into the light. We shall know. And then you will stop doing them because you are scared. But your heart is still the same. You're still thinking about doing bad things. That's not what God would want. Some of these things that we do, nobody will ever find out about them. But guess what? There is one that sees all things, man. And that's a terrible thing that God himself would look at me after doing all these things on the earth and say to me, listen up, man, listen, depart from me. And see, yesterday when I was reading the story of Evangelista Bonke, I thought to myself, imagine if this man, after arriving at heaven, after his death, knowing and everyone knowing that he has done the work, if he gets there and God says to him, depart from me, you. That brought sorrow in my heart last evening when I was reading about his story. To, to just think about it. I'm not saying that is what is happening, of course. I'm just saying, I, I just tried to imagine. What, what would it be like? Imagine everyone in the world expects that you are there. We are just going into the festivities. You will travel and go home, go to hotels, and maybe go to be with your family and so on and so forth. You go and you sit in those places, and you, your family is looking at you. kadogo, kunywa. Kunywa kadogo. Kunywa kadogo, so your family knows, ah, this one belongs to God. But you know in your heart of hearts, you always sneak a drink and drink. So you still drink, but they don't know it. Ama you appear there with your spouse, and you're yeah, lovey-dovey, Christmas spirit, and they're like, wow, hey, you're looking great. But you know in your heart of hearts that you have a affair somewhere. Uko. Ni vinye pia ameenda kuwa na watu wao. So everyone in your family knows that you belong to God. But God is looking from heaven and he says, depart from me. You worker of iniquity. Oh man. That is a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing for God himself to say, uh-uh. Go away, I don't... Especially if he would say, I never knew you. After all these years. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you must have known me at some point. What? But there's no chance for bargaining or, or appealing. But you see, and Bonke used to say this. Bonke used to say this. The gospel is not mad news. It is glad news. 
The gospel does not leave you in a place of condemnation telling you you're terrible, you're wicked, hell is for you, <laughs> the devil is happy for you. No. The gospel is glad news. It says you are a terrible person, but there is a better sacrifice. His name is Jesus. And if only you believe him, there is life everlasting for you. So all you need to do is just to accept. Charles Spurgeon used to say, salvation is like the, the empty hand stretching forth for a flowing stream of heavenly arms. It is just you saying, Lord, I'm here. I'm receiving. I'm ready to receive. The empty hand stretching forth for the flowing stream of heavenly arms. All you need to do is just to say, yes, Lord, I believe. My heart is terrible. My heart is wicked. Because this is such a personal thing. I will stand here and imagine if I'm standing here preaching to you guys and the gospel is benefiting all of you, but God in heaven is looking at me and wondering, depart from me, you work of iniquity. That is a sad thing. You're seated there listening to me. Nobody knows about you, but God himself, the designer of the thoughts and intentions of man, he sees, man. I pray that God is going to help us. So finally, the Lord says, after giving this, this um, close or the epilogue in uh, Revelation chapter 22. He says, I am coming with my reward. It is in my hand. Let the person that is wicked continue to work wickedness. My memory is fresh. That's what God will be saying. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. He says, the Lord is not unjust. He will not forget the good works you have done. Continue to work in them. If there are areas that are failing, God still has room in this service, he still has room for you to cross over, for you and me to cross over and say, yes, Lord, I take your help. Remember mercy. There's still room. The singer sang the song and said, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, he receives a pardon. Because other people might never know about it. But God, he sees it. And he's the one with whom we have to do. That's what the Bible concludes by calling it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. He's the one with whom we have to do. I know other people around here look like they're the ones with whom we have to do. But they're not. These are just pawns. Your neighbor is just a pawn. They're just people that have been placed there for, you know, just to make this life doable. The one we have to be accountable to is our bridegroom. And he's coming. He's coming back again. It may tarry, but it shall surely come to pass. Because every word that proceeds from the mouth of God shall not fall to the ground. If he said he's coming back, he's coming back. And we must be ready for him. So what is our, our resolution, therefore? Or what is our place? Our place is to say, Jesus, I accept. It would be terrible if you said to everyone else, depart from me. Including myself. Lord, I don't want that. How do you stay in God? You Reach out to him. Jesus, saying in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, in the story of the adulterous woman, just after the woman has been released and he says to her, go and sin no more. Jesus says to the woman, um, he says to the woman, go and sin no more. Um, scripture says in verse 12, Jesus then turned to the congregation and said, or to the uh, crowd and said to them, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not be caught in darkness. And Charles Pageant puts it this way. He says, if any man were fast enough to run after the sun, Jua, if any man were fast enough to run after the sun, that man would never be in darkness. If you were fast enough to run, to Kimbizana na Jua, Jua ikiwa Kenya, uko Kenya. Ikiwa Australia, ndio uyo ume Kimbizana na ayo. Ikiwa America, uko America. Ikiwa wapi, uko. If you were fast enough to run after the sun, you would never be caught in darkness any day. So it is for the man that can run after the son of God the light of the world. You will never be caught in darkness. You see, the beautiful thing is that you don't need speed to run after Jesus. You just need an open heart. You just need a willing spirit. The Bible says a broken and contrite heart, God cannot reject. He will accept it. He can't stay away from it. He wants it. He wants us to say, Lord, I am weak, but you, you are strong. God, I cannot do this. Only you are able to help me. His name is the one that can save us. The Bible says everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. His hand is able to uphold us. Jude chapter 1 verse 24. He alone is able to keep us from falling. And his name is able to sanctify us. John 17, 17. It says that sanctify them by your truth. Jesus is praying to the Father. Praying for you and for me. He says sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Call on his name. Immerse yourself in his word. And finally, 
give yourself to his hand. Only Jesus is able to save, to sustain, and to satisfy. Lift your voice right now and say to God, please, Lord, remember mercy. It will be a terrible thing for everyone to know me as belonging to God, but you yourself. I cannot imagine that on that day, Lord, I will come up and you will say to me, depart from me. God, remember mercy. Just reach out to God. Reach out to God right now. Reach out to God. The Holy Spirit has been ministering to us throughout as I was speaking. I'm sure he was shining light in some parts of your life. Some areas of darkness that other people might not know about. Some areas that maybe you did not even know about before coming to this service. But he's been revealing to you because the entrance of his word brings light. And you're crying out to God and saying, Lord, help me. Remember mercy. Let me not be known as yours by everyone else but you. I don't just want to appear whole. I want to be whole. I don't just want to appear delivered. I want to be delivered. I don't just want to appear saved when I travel, when I sit with friends and family. I want to be saved for real. I don't want the appearance of good. I want good. I want you, Lord. Master, save our souls. Save our souls. Save our souls. It would be terrible if you said to us to depart from you on that final day because then what? Where would we go? Who would we turn to? Oh, remember mercy, precious King. And save us. Some of us are in such deep, deep pits of confusion and darkness. We wouldn't know how to get out. But this morning you say to us, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And if only we stretch forth our hands, you will hold them and lead us out. You are the way to the Father. Help us, Lord Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord Jesus, help us. We need a Savior, and you are our Savior. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We cry out to you. We cry out to you in this service today. Help us, Lord. Help us as we reach out in faith to you, Lord, concerning our lives, our personal lives, concerning our thoughts, our intentions, the things that are not hidden from you, things that you can see. Help us, Lord. Remember mercy because you know them that belong to you. You know them and you call them to depart from evil. You call us to depart from evil. As you shine your light into our lives, oh God, into our darkened hearts, Help us, Lord. We call on your name that we may be saved today. We trust in your hand that we would be delivered. And we believe in your word that we would be sanctified. Maybe in this house you've never given your life to Jesus. This is the start of it all. There is no way, there is no way, there is no way for you to do any good works that would cause you to spend eternity with him. If you lift up your hand right now, we will sit, we will pray with you, we will lead you to Jesus. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you lift your hand, we will pray with you right now. The Lord knows those that are his. That is not a statement of condemnation, it is a statement of life, an invitation to belong to his family. He would love that you belong to his family of your own decision. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we give you praise. We ask that it will please you, O oh God, to turn us again to yourself and change us to be more like you, more like you, Lord. We just want to be more like you. That it shall be known in this year, KZ, there is a remnant that belongs to God. Not just known by the people of the world or by other churches, but known by you, that we belong to you. Do this to the praise of your name and to the fame of your kingdom and do it to the shame of the enemy because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.